OK, so let's talk about modeling on-chip network with Garnet. OK, so if we remember, uh, when we were talking about Ruby, when we opened up the black box, which is Ruby, we have a bunch of controller models. So um, in our MSI, we had L1 cache controllers and directory controllers. Um, in Chai, we have a bunch of different uh, cache controllers that are configured different ways. Um, and then, uh, so we have all these controllers. And then we have some topology for the controllers, which is how they're connected together, and then an interconnect model. So what we're going to do is kind of dive into this on-chip interconnect and see information about the controller topology and interconnect model. So the topology, which is going to be specified in our Python configuration, as we'll see, is how these routers and switches are kind of connected together. Is it a mesh? Is it a ring? Is it a uh, crossbar? Is it uh, all to all? These kinds of things. And then the interconnect, we have two different interconnect models in Gem5. We have the simple interconnect model, um, which is relatively fast, but you can only change the link bandwidth and uh, latency. And then we have Garnet, which is the detailed model uh, for routers. So this is a cycle level model for routers. It's like a three stage router pipeline. Um, and that models, uh, yeah, a three stage router, flow control, and link architecture. Garnet also models uh, things like um, serialization and deserialization um, and clock domain crossings as well. And I think it can model 3D um, like TSVs um, in the interconnect. So first we're going to create a simple ring topology and then we're going to extend that ring topology to use Garnet instead of the simple network. So when you're creating a topology, um, so this is from the previous uh, model and cache coherence slides. Um, essentially what we have is two different kinds of uh, things that we create. So we create routers. So these red things are routers. Um, and in the simple network, these are just switches. And then we create external links from those routers to the controllers. And these external links in the network, these are what our message buffers are connected to. So if you remember the message buffers from Ruby last time, where you send messages into the network and receive messages from the network, these are done through external links um, from the side of the network. So then once we have our external links and all of our routers, we can then create internal links between the routers. Um, and so these internal links are what's specifying our topology. So for instance, if we're doing an all to all, which I think I drew enough um, arrows there, um, if we do an all to all, then we need a link for every single pair of uh, controllers in our system. Any questions so far? OK. So let's create a ring topology. And I want to create this exact ring topology where we have two cores that are next to each other, then a memory controller, then an L2, and then two cores that are next to each other, then a memory controller, and then an L2 all on this ring. So let's jump over and look at the code for this. So like a lot of stuff in Ruby, um, as we've been going through, there's some weird things going on. And you kind of have to just take my word for it that this is the way that you do it. OK, and let me open up the other slide deck real fast. Looks like I forgot to create a ring.py that doesn't have the answer in it. So instead of doing that, we will just look at the code in ring.py. Okay. So um, the first thing we'll look at is uh, in the, oops, apologies for that. We're going to um, extend the simple network class with our ring. Um, and the init, uh, the constructor, is just going to take the Ruby system. We're going to set the Ruby system. And then for the simple network, we have to set self.netifs equal to an empty list. If we don't do that, we'll get an error. Um, but the netifs are only used in Garnet, which we'll see in a minute. 
So then the main function that we have to implement is this connect controllers function. So one thing I want to point out with the connect controllers is if we go back to this picture that we're trying to do, so we're going to be building off the Chai L2 um, uh, two-level protocol that we looked at a minute ago. Um, what we want to do is with four cores, we want things to be laid out in this particular order. So that means we need to kind of specialize this ring topology to work for this particular order. I didn't make it clear what would happen if we did two cores or eight cores. This topology is really only valid if you have four cores. So in the connect controllers function, I'm going to pass in the precise uh, controllers that I want to do. So the L1 controller, the L1i controllers, L1d controllers, L2 controllers, memory controllers, and DMA controllers. And then I'm also going to assert these things to make sure that we have the exact right number of controllers. Because again, my ring topology is not going to be valid anymore if I have eight cores instead of four cores. At least not what I was thinking. OK. So after I do that, I'm going to create all the routers that I need. So again, I'm going to pop back over to my picture. So what I want to do is I want to create eight routers, one router for each of the cores, where I'm going to connect both the L1i and the L1d to those routers, and then one router for each memory, and one router for each L2 cache in my system. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm creating L1 routers. Uh, so I'm creating a router uh, for I in range 4. And then I'm creating an external link between my L1 cache controllers and these routers. One thing I want to point out, which is terribly um, annoying but required, is you have to specify the link ID for every single link. And this ID has to be unique. Um, so be really careful when setting this up with your link IDs. There's probably a way to automatically do this in Python, but it's not done that way. So after I create my L1 routers and those external links, I'm going to create my two L2 routers um, and those external links, and then finally my two memory routers and those external links. So if we're running in full system mode, we also have to deal with DMAs. So I'm going to take all my DMAs and just plug it into one particular router, which is the last memory router. So all my DMAs are going into that last memory router in this case. Any questions on this so far? Kind of making sense? OK. Um, so now that I've done that, the next step is creating the internal links. So this relatively long uh, list here is manually creating each one of these eight external links, which is going in a circle. So I'm creating a link between L1 router 0 to L1 router 1, L1 router 1 to memory router 0, and so on and so forth through here. So now that I've created all these links, we've finished our topology. The only last thing I have to do is um, the Ruby network requires that we specify the self.ext links and self.routers. And so I went ahead and um, added those to, uh, to this object. So with that, we have our topology specified. So we can take our um, protocol, that this hierarchy that we had before, and instead of using the point-to-point -point hierarchy, like we did last time, so in incorporate caches, instead of using uh, Ruby system network equals point to point, I now say ring. And then down here, when I call connect controllers, I am passing in uh, these controllers, the L1D controllers, the L1I controllers, the L2 controllers, memory controllers, and DMA controllers, all separately. Unlike last time, where I just passed all the controllers in in one big list since point to point doesn't matter what the order is. Questions? I know I'm kind of blazing through this. One other thing I want to point out here, I'm a little bit surprised no one asked the question. 
But so in this example, I have two different L2 caches. And they're um, set up such that they're essentially two banks of one logical L2. And we are interleaving the addresses between them based on the seventh bit of uh, the, the address. So this is creating an address, two different address ranges. One whenever the interleave match is zero, and one when the interleave match is one. Um, so one of the L2 caches will get all of the even number of blocks, and the other L2 cache will get all the odd number of blocks. So this is a way to do banked caches um, in Ruby, and specifically in the Chai network. So that's how I ended up with two L2s. And I assume that the memory is going to be interleaved using a similar uh, bit pattern. OK, I won't bore you by making you go through it. Um, but when we run this test, run the traffic generator test that we've been running, we now get uh, these results for read bandwidth um, out of our generators. I want to note that this, I think this is two gigabytes per second. Someone want to argue with me there? No, that looks like two gigabytes per second. That is different than what we saw uh, using the point-to-point -point network from before. So before with the point-to-point -point network, we actually saw 2.8 gigabytes per second. So unsurprisingly, when we changed our network from a point-to-point -point network to a ring-based topology, the bandwidth that we were getting from memory goes down, even though we went from one memory controller to two memory controllers. OK? So here's an idea. I'm not going to jump all the way back to my picture. But in our picture, we had CPU cores, then memory, then the L2 cache banks in the order, which seems like a pretty bad order, because you need to send something from your L1 cache to the L2 cache, and then if it misses in the L2, then you go to memory. So that would take multiple trips around this ring. So it seems like it might be a better idea to switch the L1, sorry, switch the L2 in memory. So when you're going around your ring, you go from L1 cache to L2 cache to memory, instead of L1 cache memory, then L2. This way you don't have to go around the ring as many times. So if you switch them, which this code switches those, um, the memory in L2, and then rerun this test, we go from 2 gigabytes per second up to 2.3 gigabytes per second. So cool, that actually worked. By changing the topology, we were able to get higher bandwidth out of our system. Um, and I'll also note that when we were looking at this using the simple point-to-point, You know, most of the bandwidths between different cores were about the same. So we had, um, I don't know, what is that? Less than 10% difference uh, between the bandwidths on these cores. But then when we go to the ring-based topology, we're seeing a little bit more of a difference between the bandwidths to the cores, because some of these cores are actually closer to memory than other cores. OK, so now uh, Garnet. Or any questions about any questions so far before I start talking about Garnet? Okay. So here's kind of the trade-offs between the simple network and Garnet. So the simple network, the router microarchitecture is quite simple. All you can specify is the latency and the number of virtual channels. Whereas with the Garnet router, um, you can specify the number of virtual channels on your router. Um, you can also specify the number of virtual networks, which is subtly different somehow. I don't actually know. Um, and you can also s specify the size of the flit um, in the router. Um, on the link side, so on the simple network, we can just specify the bandwidth factor. Um, but on Garnet, there's separate links for data and flow control. So the network data and the credit links are different. Um, it supports clock domain crossings across links, supports serialization and deserialization, um, and supports 
a particular width of that link. So you can have like a foot size and a width of the link be different as well. So also in Garnet, we have much more detailed routing algorithms. So in the simple network, it just builds a simple table to do routing. Um, but in Garnet, we can actually choose either shortest path routing, you can uh, choose XY routing if you're in a mesh, um, you can use link uh, weight-based routing uh, to set up your uh, routing table uh, statically ahead of time, or you can use customized routing algorithms. So you could even use uh, extend this and use dynamic routing algorithms um, in your on-chip network for Garnet. Um, so I mentioned this a little bit. Um, so we have clock domain crossings, uh, where both external and internal link, you can operate at different uh, frequencies, um, serialization and deserialization, and then uh, the credit links and bridges for the clock domains are automatically created for you um, when you're crossing these things. Okay, so what I did was I took that ring topology that we did, and we'll look at the code in a second, and converted it from using simple network to Garnet, and then all of a sudden, it broke. Um, I ran it, and there was a deadlock in my system. I played around with it for a while, and there's definitely a bug somewhere. So this is the, uh, the good thing and the bad thing about using Ruby and Garnet. The good thing is, uh, it models everything at a high fidelity. The bad thing is that means you have to get everything right. And there's something wrong somewhere in this code. Um, I'm not sure if the problem is in the way that I've defined the ring. I'm not totally sure if the problem isn't something in the Chai protocol, or maybe it's something else. I don't know where the problem is. It could be almost anywhere. Uh, but there's definitely a bug. But I did find a hack around it, so we can at least get some data to look at it. Okay, so if you want to change this ring to use Garnet instead of the simple network, it's relatively simple. We remove this one line here, which is set up buffers, and then we substitute simple network for Garnet network, simple external link for Garnet external link, and simple internal link for Garnet internal link. And that is about all you have to do. The only other thing you have to do is now specify these network interfaces, so self.netfs, you need to create a Garnet network interface for every external link that you have. And then, you know, Garnet has a lot of other options as well. We mentioned a little bit it has like the flit size and also the virtual channels per virtual network. Um, it turns out if you use these values, 64 and 16, the deadlock doesn't happen, at least in my tests. Um, Essentially, what I think is going on is that the buffers in Garnet are filling up, and there's a deadlock from these buffers filling up. So I think there's probably a bug in um, Chai where it's using the wrong virtual channel to send something. But if we have enough buffers, um, it seems to not happen. Any questions so far? Okay, I know I'm blazing through this very quickly. Okay, so let's look at the results. So if you made these changes um, and then run it uh, with run test, these are the bandwidths that you get, which is actually a little bit higher than what we were seeing with the simple network. So maybe this is a more accurate um, results. I'm not totally sure, I don't know exactly what the, I didn't have a plan for the system that I was simulating or what the results should be. Um, but these are the numbers that you get. Uh, one thing that I would point out is when you run this, if you run it with simple network, it takes, um, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds, and you're on with Garnet, it takes two or three minutes. So it takes significantly longer to run the simulation when using Garnet, and this is because it's modeling things at a much higher fidelity, so therefore it takes longer. So this is yet another case of when you're running things with Gem5, you need to make a decision as the modeler. What is it that's important for me to model in my system? Where do I need to have the highest possible fidelity? And where maybe can I cut down on the fidelity and still get reasonable results? Um, and so this is another case of as you add fidelity, it just gets slower and slower. 